as opposed to this theta function. This theta function, when t goes to infinity, converges to 1 because the first term is k equal to 0. I mean, there's a k equal to 0 middle term here. <coughs> That's always 1. But as this theta function starts at 1, and therefore, as t goes to infinity, this is decaying very rapidly, faster than an exponential, k squared. Right? The first term is k equal to 1. So that's OK. It's like an exponential in t. But then after that, it's t squared and so on. All right. So we say, observe that h of s is h of 1 minus s also. Theta of x is equal to x squared. Tends to 0 exponentially fast. as x goes to infinity. The first term is equal to minus x. Consequently, thus, h of s defined by the integral is an entire function. There is no problem. I'm going from 1 to infinity. So there is no problem of a singularity here occurring from the 0. So it is only the long-term behavior of this x that's important. And even if the x is, is going to infinity, this is still pulling it down to 0 exponentially fast. So this is an entire function of s. So we have this is a function which is uh, Symmetric under s goes to 1 minus s, okay, also. 1 over s times s minus 1 is invariant under s goes to 1 minus s. I think I, I made one mistake here, but you should have noticed. I missed the fact that why do they have sort of two dots? Are you wondering? That must be carried through. So, so that, that's here. Why do they have sort of two dots? Right here. So, what we have to say is that I have to multiply this by gamma s over 2 pi to the s over 2. Thus, pi to the s over 2 gamma s over 2 times zeta s is invariant under s goes to 1 minus s. Yes, but now we still have to argue. So this is, so this first establishes this functional equation. But now we still have to argue about the metamorphic nature, thereby establishing the function. Okay. 
So the only pole of pi to the minus s over 2, gamma s over 2, zeta s is will be at the only poles will be at s equal to 0 and s equal to 1. S equal to 1 is understood. At S equal to 1, we have uh, zeta 1 as a simple pole. Gamma S over 2 evaluated at S equal to 1 is gamma half is square root of pi. That's why I made that little calculation there. That's the gamma half of the square root of pi. And pi to the minus s over 2 is at s equal to 1 is 1 over square root of pi. So it's a simple pole with a residue 1, which we have already seen. Okay? Yielding a simple pole with a residue 1. In fact, you can say another thing. Even without the Gaussian integral, you know that the Riemann zeta function has a simple pole with residue 1 at s equal to 1. You already know that. Suppose you use that fact without evaluating the Gaussian integral, you can say since the residue of the Riemann zeta function as a, with a pole at s equal to 1 is 1. The value of pi to the minus half must be cancelled by the value of gamma half to give me 1. Consequently, gamma half must be square root of pi. So, you, so in other words, the value of the gamma function can be calculated by at half by just using this fact that the residue of this pole, there's only one way in which you can get the residue to be 1, and that's this way. So you don't have to use the Gaussian integral, is what I'm saying. I mean, this is another way to, to deduce gamma half to the of pi. You know, yeah. at one time, I remember, American Mathematical Monthly, you know, had a span of two years. I was then a graduate, an undergraduate student in India. One more proof that summation 1 over n squared is pi squared over 6. So similarly, people are giving different proofs of gamma half to the square root of pi. I mean, it's coming from different angles. So this is coming from just comparing the goals of the big one theta function. Okay, so what about s equal to 0? So what about s equal to 0? Well, this has a pole. But at s equal to 0, the gamma function has a simple pole. Therefore, the Riemann zeta function must be analytic at 0. All right, there, gamma s has a pole, has a simple pole at s equal to 0. Thus, zeta s is analytic at s equal to 0. <coughs> because the pole of the gamma function is what has been matched with the simple pole of this at s equal to 0. So this has got to be analytic, it cannot have a pole. Finally, we have to observe that s goes to 1 over s. All this has been done in sigma greater than 1. We began in sigma greater than 1. So we still have this pole, which is the critical strip. So we just have to make a comment here. So the functional equation, as derived, connects the real part s greater than 1 with real part s less than 0. In fact, you can put real part s greater than or equal to 1, because the Riemann zeta function has been extended to the 1 line, right? right? Less than or equal to 0. But we have extended the zeta function to sigma greater than 0 already. function holds in a 
then set, then it has to hold everywhere. Because if it holds in a dense set, that means the difference is an analytic function which vanishes identically in that dense set. And if it is an analytic function, then it must be vanishing everywhere. Therefore, if the functional equation connects s with 1 minus s from the right half plane, that is sigma greater than 1 to sigma here, and we know that the function can be analytically extended all the way through, then that functional equation will also extend to this domain. And consequently, it's a functional equation valid everywhere. So the analyticity, identity theorem, confirms that the functional equation holds everywhere. So this is very important, that the identity theorem for analytic functions uh, establishes the functional equation. So, I did. so this is one of the greatest features of the theory of analytic functions is that we have this remarkable identity theorem. But it's only for analytic functions. It is not for um, real valued infinitely differentiable functions. Okay, it's really for complex analytic functions. Now, one comment here, looking at the data function. Suppose you look at summation e to the minus nx for x greater than 0, or real part x. This is a convergent series. How big does this become? This is exactly, apart from e to the minus nx, it's this, right? Is that this? Forget about this as x. So now let x tend to 0. This is like 1 minus x approximately. So this is divergent like 1 over x as x tends to 0. As x tends to 0, this is tending to infinity or t tends to 0, this is tending to infinity. But the theta function as it tends to infinity is vanishing, because I'm starting at k equal to 1. So this is gone. So this is divergent like 1 over square root of t. And the reason for the square root is, you are summing this over e to the minus nx over all integers. Here you are summing it over squares. The density of the squares this is what is playing into this game. So this is divergent only like 1 over square root. That's why this integral is still convergent. Because something which is on the order of magnitude of 1 over square root, I can still integrate from at 0, near 0. But something which is on the order of magnitude of 1 over x, I cannot integrate near 0 because it will explode. So one has to check these orders of magnitude before making sure that these transformations work. So finally, let me say that if you take the same function equation, and use the fact that the gamma function has poles at the negative 0 and then quite about the 0, we've already dealt with the 0, at the negative integers, I wrote this somewhere. Then the pole, there are, so this function has a pole at s over 2 equal to minus 1, which means s equal to minus 2. It has a pole at s over 2 equal to minus 2, which means s equal to minus 4. So this part has a pole. But that's analytic and this is entire. So that means this must have a zero to cancel the pole of that. So that is why the Riemann zeta function has zero at minus two, minus four, minus six, and so on. All right. So the poles, so in the equation 12, from 12, we see that.
must have zeta s equal to 0 at the negative even integers. And these zeros are called the trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function. So these are called the trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function. So then we have to have what are called the non-trivial zeros. Now the question is, how do we even know that the zeta function has zeros inside the critical strip? So what we're going to do is we're going to appeal to the order of growth of, of this entire function. And from the order of growth, we are going to get an estimate for the number of zeros of the Riemann zeta function inside, let's say, a large circle. And that number of zeros in a circle of radius r will be of order of magnitude r log r. But the minus 2, minus 4, minus 6, dot, dot, dot is only of giving you zeros of order r over 2 in a circle of radius r. Therefore, since r log r is much greater, is greater than r over 2, there must be infinitely many zeros inside the critical strip. Because you've got a greater order of magnitude. That is how we're going to deduce that the Riemann zeta function has infinitely many zeros on the critical strip. But before I get so, that's called the Riemann Farman Gold formula. So coming up next will be the Riemann Farman Gold formula, but also I want to give you a flavor of Ramanujan's genius. So I'm going to give you Ramanujan's outrageous proof that uh, zeta minus 1 is minus 112 first, and then from that uh, we will also use the same method to show zeta minus 2 is 0. But if we give that a formal problem for you to use Ramanujan's outrageous method to show zeta minus 2 is 0. We'll actually calculate the value of zeta half, zero, and that'll turn out to be one half or minus one half. And then we will use a beautiful formula of Ramanujan to show that the zeta function has no zeros on the one line. And if we finish all that, we'll do the Riemann von Mandel formula. And after that, we want to ask ourselves the question: How Riemann hypothesis says that all the zeros are on the half line? That's still unsolved problems. It's probably the greatest unsolved problem in mathematics. But we will show that there are infinitely many zeros on the half line. That is the theorem of Hardy. So, Hardy's theorem. So, we'll do some analysis of the zero function.